Hello everyone, and we're back. And today's um, video will be about what we're doing after we have our purified uh, DNA, so after PCR purification. So this is again a continuation of the uh, cloning tutorial videos. So at this point in our uh, project, we have a purified DNA that's been uh, that's been um, PCR purified, it's been gel confirmed, all that stuff. So what do we do next, right? What do we do next? So the next step is that we need to ligate the DNA. Um, yeah, we need to ligate the DNA into the vector, right? So we can have the construct created. So right now we have the, you know, tons and tons of this DNA fragment that's been PCR purified, but it's not in the vector yet. So what do we do? We need to cut it out. Well, not cut it out, sorry. We need to cut the ends off and also the vector so we can, you know, like it a whole entire thing together. And that's why we have those restriction enzyme sites inserted within the construct. Uh, if you can recall, we used the ecor one site and we used the, uh, oops, sorry. And we used the XPA one site, right? So right now, so right now we have, uh, you know, tons of purified DNA, which is uh, the, uh, the fragment, the insert, right? So we PCR'd it, all that stuff. And then we also have a purified, uh, purified, uh, oh, I can't spell today apparently, purified uh, vector, right? Which is also DNA, but that we don't need a PCR or anything, obviously. You could have gotten this just from your PI or you could have grow it, grow, grown it up, you know, through glycerol stock or whatever. So, so right, so this is the, uh, the vector, which is also DNA that we need to uh, we need to ligate the in ligate the insert into. Okay, so the first step we need to in order to accomplish this is to do the restriction enzyme site digestion. And from our design, we have chosen uh, ECOR one and uh, XBA one. <coughs> so these two sites are the ones we want to use to digest. And before you do that, you need to check the, uh, the NEB website or whatever um, company you're using these enzymes from. NEB is uh, the most common common uh, source of enzymes. So here we have uh, ECOR1 and here, you know, the, order, the ordering inf information, all that stuff. But as you can see, it shows the recogni recognition sites. And uh, what's most important is this part right here, right? Activity and NEB buffers. So it'll be supplied with different buffers and then, you know, different enzymes operate in different conditions. And, you know, for this enzyme, it's really good because it's 100% active in all four buffers. So that's really good. And also, survival in reaction is triple uh, pluses, which means that it'll be active, you know, more than eight hours. So it's a very active enzyme and it's very versatile, able to, you know, do its thing basically in, uh, in all four buffers and you want what you want to do is use a buffer that both enzymes will have great uh, efficiency so if you check XBA1 so it has zero activity in EB1 but 100% in 2 and 4 and 75% in 3 so ideally you want to use 2 and 4 only and fortunately for us because ECOR1 works in every single one we can just either use 2 or 4 it doesn't really matter at all Again, this one also has, you know, great uh, activity over long duration of time. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much the main things you want to check when you're deciding which enzymes you want to use. Another thing is, um, I guess, would be the methylation sensitivity. This doesn't really come up often, but sometimes it does become issues. So DNA can become methylated, right? So addition of methyl groups. And it's very common in prokaryotic, eukaryotic cells. So sometimes this methylation can actually prevent, you know, the enzyme, physically prevent the enzyme from, you know, recognizing the sites and thus cleaving the DNA, having, you know, endonuclease activity. So you might want to check this, but usually this isn't an issue, but sometimes if you're using, you know, DNA and you're not cutting it for some reason, this might be, you know, happening. Methylation might be blocking your enzyme. 
So, so right. So those are the two enzymes we decided to use, and we checked it out. And you know, we can use either uh, any B buffer, you know, four or two. Right? It doesn't really matter. Um, so once you, so you have the purified DNA, and you have the vector. And basically, what you want to do is just add in any B buffer. You want to add in your DNA, of course, either your insert or your vector, and you want to add in. Uh, some BSA for the reaction and uh, of course your enzymes so like a typical a typical um, reaction so typical reaction let's just say I don't know um, so we have DNA right typical reaction let's just say 50 microliters right and then You'll have, you know, the E. coli, E. coli 1, and then you'll have some X. Ba 1. You have 10X BSA, which is again will help with the reaction. And then you have NEB buffer, like let's just say, let's just use 4, right? And then you usually have some water. So these are usually the components of a, of a restriction enzyme reaction. Well, you don't have to use 50 microliters, you can use less or more depending on what you eluded your. DNA into after PCR purification, but you know, you call it one X file one, you usually use like one microliter be all right. Um, one microliter, all right. 10 XBSA, you know, just diluted to factor, you know, dilute to final concentration of one X. Same thing with any before, dilute uh, to final concentration of. Uh, Sorry, of one X. So if your total digestion volume is a hundred microliter, you will want to use uh you know ten microliter, ten X BSA and ten microliters any before. If you're using like fifty microliter total, just use five microliter of each, you know, etc. And water just you know usually bring up, bring up to you know final volume whatever that might be. You know, and it usually typically ranges from fifty microliter to hundred microliter final volume of a reaction um so yeah that's kind of a typical reaction you will run for digestion and usually you uh digest at uh, 37 degrees c so you know use a water bath with like a heating block for um well there's you know on the website you know it tells you exactly you know how many units you use per microliter of enzyme and that will help you know depending how much dna you have that will that you know range from you know a couple hours or whatever you can calculate all that but typically people um, usually do this for for at least uh, two hours um, I what I like to do is uh, do it overnight um, some people don't recommend this they say that might over digest your DNA okay well I guess that is a possibility but I never really had any issues with it so use it your you as your discretion but because the enzymes we're using, you know, Ecar one x Xbot one have a very long longe longevity, you know, of digestion. So digestion overnight wouldn't be an issue. But if you're using an enzyme that's, you know, oh no, fizzle out in like two hours and you keep using it to digest. See, to me, that wouldn't be an issue, right? Because the enzyme just wouldn't work anymore. It wouldn't cause any problems, really. I mean, letting it digest longer just wouldn't really do anything at all. But, you know, in this case, maybe if you have an enzyme that lasts for a long time and you keep digesting it, it may over-digest. But again, this is kind of up for debate because I've heard many people doing different things and there's no consensus, really. Um, just kind of listen to your PI for this, I guess. Usually, usually it's at least two hours for complete digestion. But depending on, like, you know, how, you know, if you want to really linearize your vector, or you know, really you know, make sure everything's cut. Maybe do it overnight, you know, or like you know, 10, 12 hours, you know, whatever. So this is really kind of depends on many things. Um. So yeah. So this is a digestion, right? And the purpose of it is to obviously cut your insert on, on each end, and then also cut your vector. So your vector is, you know, it's circular, PFAS back is circular. So you want to cut out E car one, X bar one side, and you want to linearize the vector. So at both ends will recognize the both ends of your insert, and then th those two can come together and create your final construct. And what ha the only way to do that is to do a ligation afterwards. But 
after you digest, you don't want to immediately do a digestion, right? Because you still have all this reaction in there. It's not pure DNA. So what you want to do after all this is um, do a gel purification. And this is basically running your DNA, right? Running your, your all your DNA, you know, this is your insert, your digestive insert plus your vector um, on uh, agarose gel. And then, uh, and then basically cutting the fragment out using using like a razor blade or like one of those special gel cutters, those one-time you know plastic gel cutters, cutting the fragments out, cutting the fragments out, and then you want to run it through a gel purification kit. Again, it's very similar to the PCR purification kit, but you know it involves you know uh, melting the gel in like buffer QG, and then. Well, this is like a kaijin kit, by the way. It's very common. And then basically you're running it through a column in which, you know, DNA is bound to the column, and then you're looting it out using a buffer solution. It's very similar to a PCR purification. So what's also good about gel purification is that it also kind of doubles as a confirmation step because if you're running the gel and you're seeing the bands and they're of the right size, then you know, okay, this is really good. I have, you know, really well uh, purified DNA. Um, but if you're seeing multiple bands, that might be an issue because then it means like your enzymes like cutting somewhere that you really shouldn't be cutting. So that's bad. So this kind of doubles up as a confirmation step. But one of the really key factors is that if you're using a UV system for gel, cutting gel, cause right now, you know, there's a system that you don't need to use UV light or ethidium bromide. But if you're using, um, if you're using ethidium bromide, ethidium bromide, you know, plus the UV system that you must cut quickly. I can't em em emphasize this enough, okay? Couple seconds of UV exposure, cut the band, turn it off, that's it, okay? If you have multiple bands, turn off the UV w w in between, you know, cutting out different bands. Because the longer you have UV exposure, the greater chance it's gonna cause, you know, mutations in your DNA, and that's really bad, so cut quickly. So once you cut it out and the gel purified it, your uh, your next step, I guess, to make creating a construct is um, basically ligation, right? So ligation and ligations are pretty much just combining the two DNA fragments together, your insert vector, and the typical reaction will be like you know. Um, so you have your vector. Usually people use like two microliters of the stuff. Your DNA inserts, you know, uh, six microliters, and then you have you use a T4 DNA ligase, like one microliters of this, and then T4 DNA ligase buffer, one microliter, right? And you usually do this like overnight or whatever. So again, ligations are another area where it fluctuates depending on the lab. Um, you always kind of want more insert and vector, right? Because then you don't want to have a high background once you start picking colonies. But some people, you know, you want to have equal molar amounts, basically. So, if your vector in DNA, like if your vector is not very bright on the gel, but your DNA has tons of it, then you can you can probably use like, you know, you know, three microliters of each, and it'd be perfectly fine. Or even one microliter of each would be perfectly fine. But the way I'm writing it out is assuming that if you have like an equal amount of DNA insert and vector, you want to use more insert than vector to prevent high background when you're picking clones later on. So that's kind of typical. And you want to uh, keep the volume small. So 10 microliter final volume is highly, rec um, highly recommended. Is highly recommended because uh, you want to keep the volume small and increase the chance of the interactions uh, of, the, uh, of the two DNA um, fragments. And usually you do this for overnight, um, overnight, but you can actually do it for like basically, basically also 25 minutes is also viable, I guess, but I like to keep it safe and do it overnight. Some people don't like to do that, so again, this varies how long you want to run this reaction. But Regardless how long, usually it's best to run it at um, at room temperature, right? Or you can do it at 16 degrees Celsius for larger inserts, but again, that's not very typical. I don't do that, but that's really up to you. 
And um, that's pretty much it for this video. Again, that was kind of fast, but um, I'll be continuing this process in the next one. All right, I'll see you guys later then. Thanks for watching.